guys, welcome back to the workshop. Toolman Tim here, where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. It is May 28th, 2022, and this is episode 120 of the workshop podcast. So tonight we are going to be live on Float, Odyssey, YouTube, two Facebook channels, and the Telegram group. So if you're in Telegram, I'm going to be... Um, following up uh, with the chat. So if you got anything going on in there, feel free to ask questions. I will be monitoring all the way across the board. So it's Saturday. We always have kind of a little more laid back show on Saturday evenings. I always enjoy it. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about Waffle House. As you guys know, I've got this weird kind of obsession with Waffle House, but uh, we're going to talk about how Waffle House prepares like none other. But before we do, let's get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way. Uh, first off, hey, we got Liberty Meat Solutions over in Telegram. Nice to have you. So if you didn't hear earlier this week, and I'll keep announcing it so that you guys know, I am, uh, we changed some plans here. So it's going to be, it's kind of cool. Heading to Self-Reliance Festival, the first weekend in October. So last weekend in September, I'm going to be in North Carolina for Prepper Camp. And first weekend in October, I'm going to be in Tennessee for the Self-Reliance Festival. So I got to figure out what I'm going to do with about those five days in between traveling around. So if anybody's around, anybody needs any work done, um, I don't know, anybody wants any, I don't know. Anyway, we'll figure it out, but I'm excited about it. And yeah, it's going to be a killer 10 days. Cannot wait. Number two, for those of you out there that are into TikTok. So if you caught my Wednesday, sorry, not mine, but I was a guest on Nicole and uh, John Willis is Wednesday afternoon live stream, whatever you want to call it. We had a good long conversation and John was basically like, if you're not using TikTok, you're dumb. <laughs> so, well, yeah, you know, kidding, of course, but he's absolutely right. Uh, they're growing his, his presence and his social media over there is growing like crazy. And I realized I can do this without a whole lot of extra work. So I relaunched my TikTok channel. First video went up yesterday, and we're going to keep pushing it. If you're looking for the link, it's pinned here in the comments, and it's now part of the description wherever you watch this. Video, audio, doesn't matter. So if you're a TikToker, is that what we call it? I don't know. Anyway, check it out there. And number three, we are running the giveaway for the signed copy of Going Home. <laughs> Chris Dixon asks if I danced. Um, if I danced, they would kick me off a of TikTok for, I don't even know what you would want to call it, um, Indecent Exposure. Uh, making people laugh too much. I don't know, but I won't be dancing on TikTok. I can promise you that. So the giveaway for the Going Home, the signed copy of Going Home, we ran a couple of posts earlier this week. So if you see those on my social, go in, post a picture of your favorite prepper book or homesteading book and get entered. We're going to do a couple of more this week to, I, I want to get as many people into it as we can. I think we got maybe a dozen or two so far and we'll keep going with it. We got uh, Haas in here. Nice to have you. Uh, Chris Dixon, Martinson family says Waffle House, eh? Yes, I wish we had Waffle House in Canada. Today's tool. Next section. It is the DeWalt. Imagine that, DeWalt. Something I use today, actually. The DeWalt Atomic Ultra Compact Impact Driver. So on Amazon right now, there is a kit. I put the link in the description today. And uh, it is... Um, it comes with two five amp hour batteries for two ninety nine, uh, and that is the the ultra compact atomic impact driver. Used that all day today. I absolutely love that thing. So if you're looking for it, there it is. That seems to be the best package deal uh, yet. So yeah, kind of cool. All right. So every Sun Saturday evening we start off with this week in the workshop, and I just kind of fill you in on what I've been up to. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in. And uh, Liberty, I'll drop that TikTok link over in Telegram here in just a minute for you so I don't forget. Um, Haas says, I need to get some of those tools, but they're so damn expensive. I, I know, my friend. Um, I use them as a business write-off, of course, and I have a bit of a DeWalt addiction. But take your time. Don't buy anything you're not sure about. And uh, buy package deals. Wait for things to come on sale all of that. Just do what you can to save some money. Uh, I don't know if cordless tools are necessarily worth buying used, but just on, the best way is to find those deals when they're giving away a free battery, that kind of thing. So uh, 
have a sip of bourbon here, guys. Bourbon and Diet Pepsi. I'm sure some of you think that's absolutely atrocious, but Saturday night, got to have some. So if you guys were following me on social media this week, I tried to turn my head into a piggy bank. Uh, somebody posted that. I think that was on Instagram. I liked that so much I had to use it. Um, so if you are working on a step ladder, don't leave your tools on the top of a 10 foot step ladder and then go to move it because twice in the last six months, I've done that once it was, um, an impact driver. And the second time it, that was only on a six footer. So that wasn't too bad. But on this 10 footer, it was a pry bar come right down and smuck me on the top of the head. Didn't need stitches, but, uh, Mrs. Toolman took good care of me, put some polysporin and a few other things. And, um, yeah, I've got some herbal remedies coming my way pretty soon, hopefully, because uh, I believe it's comfrey salve that everybody tells me we should have on hand. So we're working on it, thanks to a good friend of mine. Uh, yes, number two, I mentioned going to Self-Reliance Festival. I am stoked about that. Trying to come up with a topic to speak on. Uh, throwing a few different ideas around. I was thinking something along the lines of like... Uh, 10 no skill ways to make a thousand dollars a month or something. I don't know. I, I just toyed a bunch of ideas. Becky and I've been talking about a few things. So yeah, if you guys have any suggestions on what you'd like to hear me speak on, I'll definitely take that into consideration. Next, um, a lot of things came out of today, but, uh, get a lot of sun. I went and built the deck for the daycare today with the new tool that I picked up. I was able to do it in one day when this job took me two and a half days last year, but part of that was digging too. 16 by 24, and I got to tell you, that quick drive screw system is an absolute frigging game changer. I would say it saved me four hours today. They, if you haven't seen them before, they are, um, well, anyway, they are collated screws. I think there's 30 of them to a strip. I looked it up. They're plastic, a plastic strip that holds the screws into place and allows you to walk along and put deck screws down while standing up. Like I said, it probably saved me about four hours and saved my back a hell of a lot of wear and tear. Uh, Haas asks if that is, if self-reliance is put on by Annie Tuttle from Backwoods, Meg. Nope, this is this one is um, Nicole Sauce from Living Free in Tennessee, and it's on John Willis's compound from SOE, Special Operations Equipment Tactical. So they've been putting them on two or three times a year. It's getting to be pretty big. I think they're going to sell out around 750 maybe more people from what I hear. So that that's pretty exciting. Hopefully by October, they'll uh, have even a few more. But yeah, so if you're if you're looking at uh, this quick drive system, now I, I went and I bought the cordless because I wanted it to be um, compatible with all my other stuff. And the, the system in Canada was about 600 bucks. You get the DeWalt, which is basically a uh, screw gun, drywall screw gun, and it comes with uh, an extension plus the quick drive attachment plus two five amp hour batteries and a charger. So I thought that wasn't horrible, but it is going to save me, oh, save my back. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and speaking of that, I, I think I'm going to do, I don't know if it'll be an episode or a segment or something, all about moving things efficiently, doing jobs efficiently. I'm sure Mr. Dixon on here is uh, pretty good at this kind of stuff too. But the older a person gets, the more you realize you only have one back. And the more I've realized that if you take your time and think about things for just a minute, you can do a lot more work with a, le <laughs> with a lot less work than what you would think. So things like uh, when I pick long, like I was moving a lot of 16 foot boards right uh, this weekend. And instead of picking it right up from one end and then struggling with it and sliding it down, you walk to the middle and pick it up there because you guys remember those like weights you used to be able to buy and they would, they would be a different weight depending on where you held it on the shaft of the weight itself. Well, that's the same way with the board. So if you pick it up on one end, you've got all that weight going down. But if you pick it up in the middle, it balances. Another thing I set up sawhorses in the yard now. So when I bring all the lumber in, I set it all up on top. So it's one last time you got to bend down and possibly wreck your back by lifting something heavy and twisting. Just those little kind of things. Uh, when I was cutting, I had 17 boards that I had to cut in half today. So you stack them all on top, push all the ends together, put one mark all the way across and zip all the way through them. Takes you five minutes to set up. Takes you 30 seconds to cut 17 boards. Sure beats the hell out of 
measuring each one, cutting each one, and it's a hell of a lot more accurate that way. So anyway, just a few thoughts on doing things more efficiently, something I've been thinking about quite a bit lately, and I think I might just end up doing a little segment or an episode on it uh, down the road. Uh, what else did, oh yeah, we got the, uh, I'm quite excited about this. You guys saw the covered deck that we're building. Um, I believe that Nicole christened it the Cook Mahaler. She calls hers the uh, Taj Mahaler. So this one will be the Cook Mahaler. And I'm pretty excited. We put in the order for the metal and it could be here as soon as Tuesday. And if not this Tuesday, next Tuesday. So that is kind of exciting. Took my... Tokarev handguns in looking to trade. I was looking to trade them in for a Glock or something like that and ran into a whole bunch of technical difficulties. Imagine that government and registrations and all this stuff. So I spent two hours on hold last week trying to get through to get these serial numbers figured out because anyway, a whole lot of government bullshit that I didn't want to deal with. So we'll see where we end up going. But it was kind of disappointing because I thought I was going to get a good deal and swap things out and couldn't do it because of a government technicality. So there you go. Uh, this week has been a pretty cool week for getting tools. I'm sure if you guys tuned in on Thursday, you saw those. I still don't know uh, which Secret Santa sent me all those DeWalt aftermarket tools. But I got to tell you that DeWalt Spotlight is friggin' incredible. That thing is bright. has two settings, but I love it. I'm going to test that out quite a bit. I got the uh, quick drive system that you guys saw, and I also picked up the attachment for my DeWalt uh, hit, um, my DeWalt trimmer. It's like um, an edger, so it has a blade on it. I've never owned an edger before. I've always done it by hand, so I'm kind of excited about that. And finally, I talked about this a bit earlier, but I have been putting that compact impact driver to the test this week, and it has passed with flying colors. Our buddy Ted from Florida has swore by that thing for quite a while. Uh, Joseph Mills from Millis Construction, he's been talking about it for quite some time, and he just loves it. And I, I got to tell you, I cannot believe the power in something with a head that's, what, three and a half inches long, something like that. So, yeah, it it was worth it for sure. Absolutely. All right, so let's get into the meat of the episode tonight, guys. This one, this is Waffle House. I didn't bring down my coffee mug, but I can tell you a little story. You guys know how, where the genesis for this episode came from. But so while we were vacationing in Daytona Beach, we had a great time while we were there. And one evening we decided we were going to go out of town to the movies because um, I don't even remember which movie it was we watched. I think it was Batman. So it was about a half hour drive out and we got back quite late. Well, for us, us old people, it was way after 11 o'clock and we stopped in to the Waffle House and we got talking and I know it's hard to believe, but pretty much anywhere I go, I end up chatting with someone somewhere. <laughs> and so we, uh, we sat down and we chatted and as we were leaving, we get out, go heading out in the truck and one of the employees was out there having a smoke. And uh, I get talking to him and, um, you know, I asked him, well, how, how long you been here? And he'd moved from up the East Coast years ago. And he said, oh, I've been here quite a while and I'm not sure how we got around to it. But eventually he said, you know, a couple of years ago when the hurricane came through here, I was the only employee working at the store. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. I Like, why didn't you close down? And he's like, well, we typically don't close down for the most part. Waffle House is known as being the store, the place that always stays open. And if Waffle House is closed, you know the shit has hit the real fan. So he said, uh, you know, you see this place here, these windows are hurricane resistant glass and the building's made out of brick. And I was the only one down there. We had basically just coffee and a few other items on the menu. And it was a lot of fun. He said, I just ri ri rode out the storm. I didn't have any family around here, didn't have anywhere to go. So I ran the store by myself and a bunch of people came in. And basically the idea was that Waffle House was supposed to be a beacon in the night or a safe harbor, a safe haven in the middle of the chaos that was a hurricane. And I thought, what an interesting concept. So I started digging and a friend of ours sent us a couple of texts when I was talking about it. And he was saying, have you ever looked into the Waffle House Index? And I hadn't. I thought, well, what the heck is this? So it turns out that uh, FEMA has a Waffle House Index. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. If you haven't heard about this, it's pretty cool. But they basically use the Waffle House 
as a gauge for how bad the weather is in a certain geographic location. I thought, this is pretty cool. So then I start going down the rabbit hole because that's what I do. And I start digging into it. And it turns out that Waffle House as a corporation is a rock star when it comes to emergency preparedness. And I'm telling you right now, I just touched on the highlights tonight and I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time to write a book right now, but I'm not kidding. This, this topic tonight interested me so much and there's so much out there that I'm like, you know, this could easily be one of those little hundred page eBooks or something like that. It, it's, it's really cool. So anyway, I thought that was kind of neat. And that is where this episode came from a month and a or so ago, late at night, Daytona beach, waffle house conversation kind of an interesting time. So for those of you who might not know, because I didn't know anything about Waffle House before we went down to the States this last time, 2,100 Waffle Houses spread across 25 states, mostly in the South. Apparently it's a Southern institution. 381 Waffle Houses in Georgia. They have the most of any state. And Atlanta has the most of any city. 132 Waffle Houses in Atlanta and only four snowplows. So go figure. And South Carolina comes in second, 144 locations. Now, if you're a Canadian who's never had a waffle, uh, never gone to a waffle house before, or if you're from up north and you haven't, do yourself a favor. If you're ever down south, stop and have a meal because I, nothing special, but man, they, they got diner coffee and diner food and the prices are cheap and it's just a cool experience for whatever reason. So this Waffle House Index that I was talking about was coined by FEMA in 2004. So it's almost 20 years old, but it's not as old as you'd think. It's one of those things that was kicking around the internet. And I thought like, it almost sounds like it's a an urban legend, but it wasn't. Uh, and basically, like I said, it has to do with how severe the storm is. So this is how it works. They got three colors on the Waffle House FEMA Index. <laughs> Green. Yellow and red. So green means full menu. Restaurant has power and damage is limited or no damage at all. So the wind might be blowing. It might be raining. Might be a few limbs down. But the stores are up and running. No problems. Yellow. So they cut back their menu at this point. So this is kind of cool. Uh, it's a limited menu. So they have no power or they only have power from a generator. Uh, or food supplies might be low. So yellow means that they might be out of power, running off a generator. or They don't have a whole lot of food to, uh, to serve at that moment. And then red is the very rare one, and that is when they are absolutely closed. And that is severe damage, like the store isn't standing, or absolutely flooded. So those are the three, green, yellow, and red. Easy to remember, right? So I get digging, and it turns out that Waffle House has four emergency menus. So you're going to see real quick that Waffle House has a plan for everything, and it's really kind of cool. So their four menus are <laughs> the no power menu. So basically anything they can cook uh, that doesn't require electricity. They have the no water menu. So if something happens that their water gets contaminated or the water mains break, they have, and then they also have a high customer volume menu. So just quick cook items. So that's when they're one of the only places open. So they, they focus on just the severe, bare specifics. And then they get the extremely high customer volume. And that's just a couple items they're cooking, basically to give you some food and a cup of coffee, just in case, so, because there's everybody wanting to beat down the door and get in there, right? So I thought this was kind of interesting. Bunch of, I'll, I'll have a bunch of quotes all through here. I'll keep it interesting for you. But so things like waffles, they require power and water. So they're basically off the menu. Funny, you know, Waffle House emergencies and nothing's up and running when, uh, when there's no water or uh, well, waffles, for instance. And, but hash browns, I thought this was cool. Hash browns and hamburgers, they can be cooked because they're on a gas grill. So they are either pumped into natural gas or in most instances, the stores have propane on hand already. So I thought that was kind of cool. So this was one of the neat quotes I read. It said, so with no electricity, you're not going to get waffles, they said, but we bring in canned drinks. Uh, no fountain drinks when the water is busted or contaminated. Uh, we'll have a lot of things you can cook on the grill. Hash browns, eggs, sausages, cheeseburgers are big on the no power menu. The griddle, the griddles all run exclusively on gas with no need for electricity. I thought that was kind of cool. Contingency plans, right? So what I'm going to do is as we go along, we'll talk about certain points from Waffle House and then we'll attempt to take a lesson from it that we can learn for ourselves when we're prepping and preparing for, you know, bad emergencies, that kind of thing. So for us, how could you not have contingency plans, right? 
I always say a lot of times that the best bet, 95% of the time we should bug in, right? But have we ever give some thought to what would happen if the water got shut off or what happens if you have no power or worse than that? What happens if you have no water and no power? What are you going to do? I thought that was kind of cool. I, I never thought about it, but no water. Well, there's going to be no fountain drinks. So they got to bring in bottled water and canned soda. Not a bad idea. Uh, something else to think about, again, is to have multiple fuel sources and different types of food. So Waffle House isn't worried about it. You know, they have electricity. Well, they're going to cook waffles. If they don't, well, they're going to cook with gas and they're going to cook things like eggs and sausage and that kind of stuff. Again, that's great for us. So electricity's out. Hop out on the deck. Fry yourself up some, you know, great stuff on the grill. Make yourself some coffee on the side burner on your barbecue. And fuel sources and different types of food. So, again, maybe have some canned beverages on hand or, of course, water storage. Because if we don't have running water, well, you're going to have a bad day, right? Uh, so, I thought this was kind of cool. They got uh, four parts to their emergency plan. So, procedures. They, uh, they have a lot of plans in place ahead of time to deal with almost any eventuality. And a lot of this sprung out of the fact that they're basically in the South, and the South is the place that deals with the, the worst hurricanes and a lot of the worst severe weather. Uh, information, so it's uh, procedures first, that's the plans. Information, they're crazy about, yeah, uh, Liberty Meat Solution says contingency, live in the South because Waffle House. Amen to that, brother. <laughs> Um, reinf oh yeah. So information, they're serious. They, they, they brag about how much of a weather junkie they are. They have, well, we're going to get into it, but it's pretty cool. How much, how much digging they do into the weather and how much technology they, the waffle house of all friggin' places has for watching the weather. Then the, I think my favorite part is the reinforcements. This is what they call their jump teams. This is the stuff and the people that they bring in in the middle of an emergency. We'll talk about that too. And then they do a review. So after every serious weather event that requires them to implement one of their plans, they do a review and they say, okay, what can we do better next time? This blows me away. I cannot believe that a company in the private sector is doing this much with preparedness. I had no idea. So let's deal with the first one there. That's the information. So um, they rely on weather forecasts. They have um, what they call the Waffle House Storm Center. So when it's hurricane season, they showed a picture of it. It's a room with a whole bunch of monitors around, and they have their own proprietary weather software to keep an eye out. So I'm not saying that, you know, you and I need to go have our own proprietary weather software, but keeping an eye on the weather, never a bad idea. But they don't just do that. They also talk to people on the ground. So what they call <clears throat> internal, for, uh, so they do internal forecasting based on their weather models, but they also call out to the managers, the employees, and they say, okay, what's going on? What do we need to do? Because, you know, the best, what is it? The best plans of mice and men. Well, that, that ends up happening with this too, right? So they're, they're looking, they say, okay, well, it looks like it's going to hit here. Well, let's call and find out what's going on. Local information is always the best. And that is their their view on life is, yes, we love our computers, but number one, we want to talk to the people that are there dealing with it and see what is happening. So uh, this was another cool quote that I found when I was doing it. They said, we are that gathering place where people get together and talk about local happenings. In other words, when the wind is blowing the rain sideways, trees are down everywhere. If people need to get a meal, they're going to be at Waffle House. And of course, what do people do when they're nervous but talk? What do people want when they're nervous? Information. And that's where people go to share information. I thought that was so cool. So what's a lesson for us on that? Well, a couple of things. First off, focus on the essentials. You know, a lot of times we're like, oh, I need a, a whole house emergency automatic generator and I need, you know, 12,000 pounds or uh, gallons of propane and an underground pig, whatever it is. Just, you know what? Honestly, focus on the things you can control, focus on the small things, you know, focus on having the water, focus on having the food. Uh, don't get bogged down in all kinds of cool details and specifics. Just focus on the essentials and information. I mean, if Waffle House can do it, <laughs> so can we, right? But 
local information, find out what's going on. Um, you know, for us, it could be a Facebook group, it could be a next door group, or it could be, you know, walking down to the local Waffle House and saying, hey, do you guys know? And also they said that a big thing that happens at Waffle House is a lot of the first responders end up there too. So you might end up having guys, you know, that are fixing the power lines or police or firemen, that kind of stuff. And of course, you know, if they have two minutes, they're going to tell you what they know as well. So it, it's always good to know where you can go to get information locally. Uh, now, this was, I think this is my favorite part. This is what they call their jump team. And I thought this was really cool. So their jump teams are made up of contractors, construction workers, gas line experts, restaurant operators, food providers, and other associates. So they're, they're basically a, a special ops team that they put together in a moment's notice. They have a bunch of different ones around the different regions in the South. And there are a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of, you know, where I'm a guy with special skills, that kind of thing. And they, they get them together and they head them out. So if they know there's a storm coming, they put them on red alert. And if they end up, if the storm hits, they send them out. And they go out in the worst of the worst sometimes. Uh, and they bring backup generators with them. They bring a metric shit ton or an imperial shit ton in this instance of food supplies with them as well. Now, the cool thing is they're, um, you know what, Cabot? I didn't, uh, so... Boil water orders, yes, I know. Riots, I don't know. I will dig more into this because there is so... Okay, so for you on audio, Cabot asked, do they monitor non-weather impacts, riots, and boil water orders? So things like boil water orders, I know they do. I, I found that mentioned in some of the reading. There's a lot out there. I will do some more digging into like civil unrest and see because I think I'm going to have to do a follow-up on this. There's it, It's the most interesting in the most boring top or it's something that sounds like it should be absolutely boring, but it, to me, it's absolutely intriguing, but yes, I know they, they do follow boil water orders and they'll send people out to deal with that as well. So, um, they bring generators, they bring backup food supplies with them, but here's the cool part. They also bring employees with them. And, uh, this was what the guy was telling me when we were sitting out there in the parking lot, in Florida chatting, they bring in backup employees so that the local people who should be working can go home and handle their house, their family, and not have to be at work when, <laughs> when they're stressed out. And I thought that that blew me out of the water. I'm like, they, it seems like they care for their employees enough that they're willing to bring outside employees in to work for them so that the people who are in the emergency don't have to worry about it. I thought that was really cool. Um, they these people get there to make sure that if the if the store did close they can reopen really quickly or more importantly they can stay open during the storm um liberty over on uh, telegram come up with the waffle a team that is the greatest four word telegram post i have ever seen that is awesome the waffle a team got to love it <laughs> and here's the other thing they do so along with the jump team they move supplies around so if they know there's a storm coming they will move supplies in the general vicinity of a storm ahead of time. Maybe not right where the storm's supposed to hit, but close enough that they'll have it when they're when and if it might be needed. Now, here's something else. They they kind of stress the idea of consistency in systems. To them, that is the key to resiliency, to being able to be uh, to to jump back up and get going when things get all torn to shit, right? So um, this is what's really neat. Stores, the stores and the emergency plans are the same in every state. So any employee can go from any store and work in any location. You walk into any, basically any Waffle House anywhere, stuff is basically going to be in the same place. The emergency response plan is going to be the same no matter where they are. So consistency across the board and standardization. I talk about standardization all the time. And so this is this is an area you know we're going to stretch a little here on the lesson, but that that's um, for us things like having all the same mason jars, all the same jerry cans, all the same batteries, and um, so where so standardization to me makes things simple, and it means that uh, there's less chance of not having what you need when you need it. Also, um, this was something else I thought. So consistency in systems, uh, something we can look at is 
does everyone in the family know how to, I don't know, find the blackout bag or start the generator? And I'm pointing at myself for this one because the rest of my family does not know how to start the generator and I need to work on that, right? Um, also, the whole idea of two is one, one is none, and three is a guarantee. That's what they, that's how that works. They have extra staff, they have extra supplies, and they bring it all in because who knows what might happen. I mean, they could blow a window out and all their food supplies get soaked and they have it coming right in. Uh, Haas says, I wonder if their CEO or owners are preppers. I don't know. It seems like, th so the very first store, I believe was in Georgia, the very first Waffle House, and it was founded in 1954. So maybe way back then, I, I think it probably just came out of practicality where it was good for business to be prepared. I might be wrong about that. Uh, but the very first Waffle House that ever opened is now the Waffle House Museum. And I believe it is in Georgia. So I thought that was kind of cool. But I don't know. I'll do some more digging and see because it, it definitely seems that whoever was the head of this company at one time or another was definitely a prepper because there's so much behind it. Uh, okay. They talked about the psychological effect as well. Um, so they said... Um, Talking to FEMA people and emergency responders, they both say that getting businesses like the Waffle House open has this psychological effect um, on people. <laughs> it makes them feel normal. It gives them that sense of normalcy. So, you know, never underestimate the power of a hot cup of coffee. I remember years ago when we had that, the, the nastiest winter storm I ever saw, they called it White Wan, and we were without power for a couple of days. That was the one where... We had to haul all the ice cream cakes out of the Dairy Queen freezer. I was so happy to go down to my aunt's house and get a hot cup of tea off of her wood stove. And that's what this is. You know, when people who are either, um, you know, disenfranchised or homeless or just don't know what to do because the storm is so bad, seeing a Waffle House open maybe just makes them smile a little bit. It means, hey, I can have a hot meal, a hot cup of coffee. It just makes you feel a little bit better. And uh, I thought that was kind of cool because with all the panic and with all the anxiety that goes along with a natural disaster, going by and seeing something as stupid and as simple as a Waffle House open, maybe just makes people feel just a little bit better. And that's the kind of thing. It's like, okay, power's out. Well, let's play Monopoly or let's, let's have a card game or, you know what, we'll make coffee out on the barbecue. Whatever it is, again, finding things for your family to bring back a sense of normalcy. Because again, especially if your kids are little, they're stressed out, the power's been out, maybe they're cold, maybe they're, I don't know, whatever it is, they can't watch Tool Man Tim on TikTok. <laughs> no, not really. But, you know, so they need something to feel slightly normal. And, that, and that's what this is. You know, these stores reopening or staying open as the best they can. It just makes people feel a little bit better. Now, here was something else that I thought, the more I dug, the more I dug them. So, so they go, whenever there is an emergency, a nasty storm, they simplify their pricing. So check this out. They cut their prices during emergencies, kind of. Uh, so bills are, I, I didn't realize this, but of course in, in states, like apparently every town or city can have a different tax rate or something. Anyway, they said, so bills are calculated with the lowest tax rate in the local market, number one. So you're going to pay the lowest tax rate, whatever happens. Then here's the cool thing. All bills, when you go in to pay, are rounded down to the nearest dollar. So, you know, if your order was $7.89, they round it down to $7. Now, for a second, I was like, why would they do that? Well, I mean, number one, it makes things more affordable for people, but it makes it easier. It makes it simpler so that during these stressful and busy times, nobody has to worry about change. But more importantly, the credit card systems might be down and people are going to be dealing with cash. So if they're dealing with cash, it makes sense to go to a simplified pricing. How crazy is that? I just thought that was one of the coolest things I'd heard. And uh, so lesson for us, keep it simple. You know, don't forget about cash uh, and small cash for that matter. Like a while back, I pulled through McDonald's. They weren't taking fifties or hundreds anymore. And that got me thinking because our emergency stash was always, you know, a few brown bills up here in Canada, which is $100 bills. And what good is a $100 bill if you need a, I don't know, $5 loaf of bread when the power's out, right? So keep it simple and don't forget about cash. But I just, I thought that was really neat how they 
I, they've put a lot of thought into all of this, round things down to the nearest dollar just to make it simple, fast, and easy for people who are struggling right at the moment. Um, this was another cool quote. It said, because of its level of preparedness, Waffle House is able to provide a place for residents to charge their phones and provide food to first responders in the aftermath of a storm. Again, hey, 30-day, uh, Justin, 30-day uh, reviews, good to have you. So again, a lot of people don't think, you know, most people aren't as prepared or preppers as we are, right? So of course you want your phone because again, that is your lifeline and you have nowhere to charge your phone because you weren't thinking, or I mean, maybe you can in your car, but maybe you're on foot. I don't know. But I thought that's kind of cool. So they offer a place you can come in, charge your phones. And of course they can provide food to all the first responders, but nice to have you, Justin. And uh, so I, as I was going along, it just kept hitting me. And I thought, how great of an example is this of what the private sector can do to provide better emergency services than the government? I mean, I know the government standard for emergency services is pretty friggin' low. The bar is so low, you'll probably trip over it. But uh, I just thought that was really neat. So digging along, you know, traditionally waffle houses are cement brick uh, cinder block buildings with big windows and fairly storm resistant, but they weren't, you know, um, they weren't hurricane proof, not that anything really is. But so what they've started doing now, I guess they've realized, hey, what, what's the next step we can take? So in Biloxi, they just built Waffle House number 2314, and it was built to a hurricane resistant code. It's the first ever Waffle House perched atop flood-ready stilts. So the whole thing is lifted up. So if it does flood, the water goes right underneath of it. And going forward, all new Waffle Houses, when they're built in hurricane zones, will be designed to local codes. There'll be elevated brick foundations and reinforced windows to withstand the worst, well, maybe not the worst, but some of the worst that Mother Nature can throw at it. So they figure, you know, we're already prepared enough. Let's start as we build new buildings. Let's start uh, building them even stronger so that we'll be even less likely to be damaged. So the next thing is resiliency. What they've built in to their system and how fast, I guess resiliency is how fast you can come back from getting knocked down. Well, check this out. I mean, everybody remembers how bad Hurricane Katrina was, right? So Following Hurricane Katrina, 107 Waffle Houses were shut down across several states. Seven were completely destroyed. So there were seven stores that were just wiped right off, you know, the map. 75% uh, of the Waffle House locations that closed were open within three days. So that would be, you know, 75, seven of them were destroyed. So yeah, I mean, so there was only, after three days, there was only 20 or so that were still closed. I thought that was really cool. And after Hurricane Irene, 22 of them lost power and all but one were back up and running in less than 24 hours. Um, yes, uh, Justin's, I like that. A 30 day review says easier to make money than claim insurance. Yeah. And I never thought of this until you mentioned it here, but if you're the only game in town, I mean, Waffle houses are tend to be busy anyway, but if you're the only game in town, you're going to be making money hand over fist as well. I mean, you know, you're not taking advantage of people. You're, you're not putting your prices up or whatever, but people are coming through left, right, and center and you're, yeah. So I, I guess it does make sense to be open in that storm. Um, so yeah, have proper plans in place, have the materials on hand and the supplies, like I talk about repairedness, right? So I, you can't stop the fact that a hurricane or a tornado or something is going to come through. But what you can do is have things in place ahead of time to make your life a little easier. Things like tarps, things like plywood, screws, plumbing pipe, whatever, you know, anything that you think might allow you to get um, a better handle on the post-disaster recovery. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so uh, it says, um, yes. Yeah, so earlier, yeah, Justin, they have what they call, uh, what did I call it? It is a, um, a, a jump team. They bring people in to handle all of these locations um, when things get bad. So yeah, it's really cool. And uh, hopefully, um, I, so I talked to a lady, this was kind of interesting when I was down in Tennessee that worked there and she made something like 250 an hour 
but she was making over a grand a week with her tips. So they get paid really well in tips at Waffle Houses. But yeah, these, these jump teams are really, really cool because then the locals don't have to worry about working through a storm. So um, let's let's break it down and go through what they end up, um, how things go. So before the disaster, and this was, uh, there was a lot of this stuff that came out of two or three articles I read. Uh, so the company, they have these carefully scripted disaster, they call them disaster recovery playbooks, and they contain easy to follow steps for basically any contingency that they that they could think of. So basically any storm, anything, you know, flooding, fires, whatever it happens to be, they've got a standard operating procedure for that in a playbook already. They got a command and control center in Norcross, Georgia, and it monitor it monitors any incoming storms that are coming their way. Uh, they even have, uh, I believe it's proprietary hurricane software called HerTrack. <laughs> it gives them up to date, um, up to the minute updates and kind of keeps an eye on those storms, you know, those nasty ones that make that last minute right or left hand turn. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, each employee gets, I'm not, I found this and I don't exactly know how it works, but they each get a key fob and it has all the emergency contact numbers on it so they can um, contact uh, management, head office, anything like that to get instructions on what to do just in case the shit hits the fan. <laughs> now, this one was kind of cool. They have these mobile command centers that are set up in custom RVs. They have satellite phones, internet links. Basically, they can roll up to the store and get their communications infrastructure up and running when things get tore down, blown down, flooded, whatever it is. Um, and then they have, the <laughs> that's awesome. Martinson family says they should call it the waffle truck or the, call it waffle tracks. Or yeah, that software, <laughs> that is great. I love that idea. And they should. Um, yeah. So they also, this one, you know, take it or leave it, but they have close relationships with the government, uh, police, fire, et cetera. And the reason for that is so that they can get through when the weather's bad. So they can call ahead and say, hey, I know you have roadblocks set up, but we need to go through. We're taking food, water, generators, and a jump team into these waffle houses. So by making those connections ahead of time, they can eliminate a lot of those obstacles before they become a problem. And this was kind of neat. I thought this was cool. All the executives in the organization are trained on how to run the restaurant. So if things are really, really bad and they go down to check out the front lines of these disasters, they can literally step in and run a restaurant if need be. So there's no such thing as a CEO that doesn't know how to sling hash. I thought that was kind of cool. So lesson out of that, make local contacts, right? I mean, Know, know your local emergency measures, emergency management board, whatever it is. Find out what does your town have planned if things go bad. Where's the warming centers? Um, where can you get comms? You know, uh, again, have a backup for a backup for a backup. You know, you have your cell phone, you have your internet, maybe have a landline, maybe have a radio, whatever. But make sure, again, one is none two is one and three is a guarantee. Always remember, right? Because I guess information when you, well, I, I just, I just read, what was the book called? Um, a last Babylon, Chris from, um, well, you know, uh, angry American recommended it. And th it was all surrounded around this small town that survived the nuclear Holocaust. And the biggest thing they starved for was information. They always felt absolutely lost because they didn't have it. So anytime you can find a source of information, do it and figure it out. Um, oh, okay. So uh, Justin just shared here, uh, to adopt a meal for a first responder, call a local waffle house to place an order. First responders may call their local waffle house to see if any adopt -a meals are available. If none are available at the time, first responders will still receive 50% off and a free drink with their purchase. How cool is that? Thanks, Justin. There's so much stuff out there that I, uh, putting this episode together, like I said, I'm sure I can do a follow-up. Um, okay. So during a disaster, uh, Martinson family says, thinking we just need to move to where there's a Waffle House. That's a great idea. Yeah, you'd have uh, somewhere to somewhere to warm up, somewhere to eat, somewhere to charge your cell phone. That'd be great. And Waffle Houses, the food's pretty freaking good if you ask me. Um, so during a disaster, uh, when a storm's inbound, they do this all hands on deck alert. Um, they get their jump teams organized. 
they get their resources in place and they have their manpower staged and ready to go. So basically this is just before the storm hits or as the storm's hitting, they have everybody ready and they're, they're on red alert. They're like, okay, be ready to go at a minute's notice. We need to send you out. They ship generators and gas supplies to the stores. So they bring in extra tanks of propane, all of that. And, uh, I, yeah, Justin says during a disaster, just about anything is a good meal as a first responder. I could imagine. I, I've never been a first responder, but I think a hot meal would feel great if you're out there in that nasty weather. Um, so the crews, they travel to affected locations and they start by repairing any structural damages to the restaurants as quickly as possible. So the design on the, the restaurants themselves are simple, which means the repairs in theory should also be simple. Uh, then they even have um, IT professionals. <laughs> I thought this was kind of cool. They bring them in and they address anything, any of the hardware issues. They find replacement parts if needed, and they assist with restarting all their computer systems. Because again, power goes out, who knows? They have centralized software. Um, there are storm maps that allow the Waffle House to know. So this, is, this was kind of cool. So not just their storm software, but they have this in-house software that brings everything together, puts all the information in one place so that it allows them to prioritize what their next steps are. And they can say, okay, which locations need food? Which ones need supplies? Which ones have no power? And then it basically helps them make the right decision as quick as possible. Uh, they secure a whole bunch of hotel rooms for their employees, both for the first responders, the jump teams are sending out, but they're also very concerned about any local employees who might be, um, having to leave their home at that point. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, then they have, oops, sorry guys. Um, and then one of the best things is the jump teams or the responders as they call them are allowed to improvise in any way they need to, to get the job done throughout the crisis. So they're not just given a plan to go in there and fix things. They're given the power to do what needs to be done to get it done. And I thought, how great is that? How many companies do you know that absolutely um, need or give all their employees the freedom to improvise, to problem solve. I love it. And uh, Justin says, I'm guessing they also have mobile internet for credit cards. They do, but they also simplify their pricing and they round everything down to the nearest dollar so that people can pay cash and not worry about fiddling with change. I thought that was kind of cool. Cut out the red tape, he says. Yes, that's what they do. And uh, so, yeah. Even, so a lesson for us, even the best plans that we might have in place, let your entire family know that if, you know, if things get really, really bad, it's totally fine to improvise. So if you're sitting down and you're like, okay, dad says I need to get to this place. Well, if this place is on fire, you need to know that you can go somewhere else or you can go get a fire extinguisher or you can call the fire department or whatever it takes. But you need to know that improvisation is okay. And a lot of times, if you've prepared, if you have the stuff on hand that you need to have, that empowers you to improvise because you're not stressing and wondering how you're going to solve a situation. You know, okay, I already know what I'm supposed to do, but I need to modify it a little bit to make it work. Uh, and then after the disaster, they revise and improve. They analyze what worked, what didn't work, you know, their successes and failures, right? And then they, after the disaster recovery is all over, they refine their standard operating procedures and change whatever needs to change so that the next time they can do even better. Again, it's hard to believe that I'm actually talking about a corporation <laughs> that seems to abs actually care. And I think, you know, I'm sure there's a bottom line issue here that they're going to make money because they're open, but it seems like they legitimately care about being a part of their community and about responding to the locals and being a place where people can come in and get a hot cup of coffee, maybe a slice of pie, although they didn't have pie when I was down there this last time, but whatever it is, get in, have a meal, and be a place where people can go when all hell has broken loose all around them. And it, I think it's a bit of pride for them too. You know, at this point, they're known as the place that doesn't shut down. You know, there's the, the urban myth that they don't have locks, or if they do have locks, they bury the keys in cement. Not true, but kind of cool. So it, yeah, like I think to them, they, they wear that as a badge of honor and they say, okay, come hell or high water, we're going to stay open. And if we have to close, God damn it, we're going to be open as quick as we possibly can. Uh, and I had uh, 
two quick quotes here to, to kind of finish up what I was talking about with the Waffle House tonight. And I thought these, these kind of, these were two quotes that really summarized what they stood for. Uh, they said, our model is distributed. And we believe in having the stores being able to operate with minimum dependency on technology. How crazy is that? The key to our success has been the interaction of our associate. The key to our success has been the interaction of our associate. The let's try that a third time. I'm sorry, guys. The key to our success has been the interaction our associates have with our customers. Our systems have been built with offline processing at its core. In other words, they want those stores to be able to run independent of the grid and just run and just be there for their customers. And then the second one was Waffle House said that their philosophy is the keep it simple. For example, the organization likes to own their own hardware, their own software, and they like to partner with like-minded vendors who will be there when they need them. So in other words, they try to find other companies that are just as passionate about emergency preparedness and about coming in with the supplies they need when the rain is going sideways. But the key, the, the early, the very first four words of the first quote I read you says, our model is distributed. Think decentralized, you know, that's like having a bug in location and a bug out location. In other words, um, we have things everywhere. We have supplies, we have caches of supplies wherever we need them, and we can bring them in as needed. I love that idea. Um, and Justin says, best way to do it so that not having to rely on a tech from another company to fix something simple. Yes. And like they said, they try to do as much as they can in-house. They have their own experts that they keep on hand and they partner when, when they can't do something themselves. They work really hard to find partners who are just as like-minded as they are. Um, and it's really neat because they give each store the independence to respond as needed. Uh, they store as much as they can in as many locations as they can, and they make sure it's available. So that, like they said, they distribute, they decentralize things, they give people independence. It just seems like the antithesis of modern retail and restaurants, you know? But at the same time, I mean, everything's standardized. It's run just like any other big corporation. But even though everything's standardized and any employee can jump from one store to another in an emergency and run the store, work at the store, they also have the independence and the autonomy to do what needs to be done to keep serving waffles, or in the case that the power's out, hash browns and sausages, if the power's out, and if the entire place is flooded all around them and they're the only place open, they want to empower their employees and their businesses to keep running so that the locals have somewhere to go and it gives them just a bit of sense of normalcy in their life. So I don't know. What do you guys think? I think that's pretty freaking cool. I had no idea that simple old little Waffle House could do an entire hour of a podcast talking about preparedness. But there was so much in there. And like, the more I researched it, the more I thought, wow, this really seems like, I don't know. I don't know if it's a book or maybe a, a like a video series on YouTube. I don't know. But this was just as intriguing to me as the video I did a while back about the Amish and their love for DeWalt cordless tools or DeWalt batteries. I don't know. They're just these simple little twists on normal concepts that have stories attached to them that just really resonate with us, eh? And uh, Haas agrees. He thinks it's pretty interesting too. So I, I don't know. I just, I love it. It was something that piqued my interest. And, you know, we may touch on this again down the road. Who knows? Or maybe, like I said, I, I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm definitely not going to sit on this topic. It just, it's too interesting not to dig into a little bit more. Um, another one that I've had beating around in the back of my head. And if you guys are interested in it, I've done quite a bit of research already, but I don't know if I'm going to call it the history of prepping or the history of preparedness, something like that. But uh, I've been doing a lot of digging into that. And I'm thinking I might do like a three or four part, uh, three or four episode series on just that, you know, basically going back post second world war, basically the nuclear age and on. And I thought that would be kind of neat. Um, 30 day review says it's good to see that large corporations can think if they're uh, with their brains um, when they actually want to. Walmart goes nuts if electricity goes out for 15 minutes. Yes. 
in doing my research, uh, FEMA did say that they have a lot of partners in the retail sector. Uh, none are as prepared as um, Waffle House, of course, but places like Lowe's, Walgreens, Home Depot, Walmart, Target. Uh, I don't know if I said Walgreens or not. Anyway, they were all listed as partners with FEMA for emergency responses. And uh, Justin says, before Second World War, it was called living, not prepping. Ain't that the truth? Um, but an interesting tidbit, the first time the term prepper was used as prepper for what we would call a prepper was 99, 1999. So it's just over 20 years old. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. I, th I figured it'd been a long time, but they had a lot of other names for it. But anyway, just thought I'd share that with you because I get these ideas that I kind of get passionate about and start going down the rabbit hole. And I started researching that one before we went down south. And, uh, you know, it might be a few months before I get it all done and, and you know, done and dusted. But uh, it's interesting enough, I'm going to do it. And we'll probably do a follow up to this one or Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll dig in and figure out some more. Uh, yeah, that's exactly where it came from. Justin was the the so he says doesn't surprise me with the the Y two K scare. Yeah, and that's kind of where I started digging. I started going through. If you guys have ever been um, down the old uh, Google News groups feed, so they they have like a I call it a rabbit hole, but they bought all the old news groups from the 80s and 90s, and they have it all online that you can search back through by keyword. It's pretty interesting. So I followed a lot of, I started reading some of the threads leading up to Y2K, and it was pretty interesting, you know, and you start listening to the stuff, you're like, wow, people were really scared about that, but ended up, I guess, people, they did a pretty good job putting things back together. So anyway, that is Waffle House and preparedness and the lessons we can learn in a nutshell. I enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. Um, so what's next this week? What's coming up? One more episode this week? I guess tomorrow is still this week. I don't know. I always call Sunday the last day of the week. But tomorrow night we got Greg from the Apocalyptic, the prepared, Apocalyptic Preparedness and Survival Skills School in Edmonton. Had no idea it existed till I saw an article in the CBC. Reached out to this guy and... I thought, hey, this is going to be cool. A fellow Flatlander, a fellow Albertan, trying to build community up here the best I can. And so I reached out to Greg and he's like, yeah, I'd love to come on. So it should be an interesting interview um, just to find out what they're doing, what his passion is, the skills he thinks people should learn and everything in between. And uh, <laughs> um, Martinson family says we were survivalists before Y2K. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. That's That was the catalyst that got me into prepping it wasn't the thing that that wasn't the day i started but it was the day i really started thinking about it for sure but yeah so tune in tomorrow night guys seven o'clock i'll have them i'll have greg on it should be a great episode got all kinds of good content coming up for you right away i got a lot of really good dewalt reviews in the pipeline and i'm gonna try to put a couple of videos a week out on tiktok so you're gonna see it on tiktok and on instagram reels and I haven't decided yet. I think I am going to, hmm. I, anyway, I think I'm going to start a second YouTube channel just for shorts. Because the last time I tried to upload the shorts to my channel, it I don't know, it seemed to really hurt the, the metrics, the analytics, and the traffic. I don't know. I might be wrong. Maybe it was just me. So I'm thinking I might just launch a second little shorts channel that pushes content both ways. Anyway, we'll see. Don't know but we'll go from there. So anyway, guys, that's it for me this week, or at least tonight. I'm going to go out, sit on the deck, finish my bourbon, hang out with my wonderful wife and enjoy the last, I don't know, we got a couple hours before it gets dark here yet. So uh, <laughs> Haas says, I'll follow TikTok for my daughters. I appreciate it. And um, Justin says, how about turning them into clips instead of shorts? I've thought about that. And I might, uh, yeah, I'm going to dig into it. If you got any ideas, feel free to send them to me too, because I haven't decided one way or the other. But um, if anybody on YouTube is looking for the TikTok link, it is pinned right at the top. And there's some people over in Telegram looking for it. As soon as I finish up here, I will post it for you guys. And we'll go from there. So as always, guys, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. <laughs>